in a season and a moment today in which we're hearing everybody else's voice. And we're seeing with everybody else's eyes. If I ask you right now what CNN is saying about something, you all would easily know. Because we are bombarded with media that's constantly picturing to us that everything is bad. But if we're going to be a prophetic community, if we're going to be a people who are blood washed, if we're going to be a people who understand that the kingdom of God is superior to that of the world, then we have to see with a different lens. And as I shared this past Tuesday, and I please, please, uh, I'm going to be sharing a lot of different things now. Some will come on Sunday, some will come on Tuesday. So please make sure that if you're not present that you're either watching live or you're getting the, the audios or recording them because I want you to have it uh, to kind of catch where I'm going. And I shared something Tuesday uh, uh, understanding first of all uh, that the kingdom of God uh, is not nationalistic. God never said that America was the kingdom of God. Amen. So when we hear terms like make America great again, we don't respond to that because Jesus said my kingdom is not of this world. And in Matthew 6, 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. So that means that I, I don't have to look at one nation being first, but God comes first. Amen. His kingdom comes first. And, and so I understand that I have to tread and hold these two intentions, the tension of nationalism and globalism, that I recognize that the kingdom of God requires me to hear the voice of God. Number two, to see the hand of God. How is he moving? Because even in unrest, he's moving. Amen. Yeah. And then thirdly, to know the times of God. To hear the voice of God. To see the hand of God. And then thirdly, to know the times of God. Let me move. What puzzles me in life sometimes is why people live so badly. It's not that everyone lives wickedly, although there is a good share of those that do. But even those that don't sometimes seem so content with the ordinary, with the mundane, and with the everyday grind. There's some people you'll see, you see them today, they're doing the same thing. You see them tomorrow, they're doing the same thing. You see them five years from now, they're doing the same thing. Even those who are prominent in our culture leave very little to admire and much less to imitate. I'm going somewhere. Famous entertainers amuse a world of bored sleepwalkers. Spoiled athletes play games for lazy spectators. Insane criminals plaster the headlines for couch potatoes to watch. And if you're content with the status quo, if you're content to just live life in the ordinary, then you fit right in with the above. But there ought to be a resolve in you sometimes that gets tired of being normal. If you're sick of the headlines and if you're in obsessed by the wickedness that we see in front of us, then you are able to understand the tension of Jeremiah in this passage. Because he's living in a world in a season in which he's called by God to give a word of God to a people who refuse to hear God. Uh, he's living in a time in which it is not popular to be a child of God. It is not popular to tell the truth. You see, I remember a few years ago, I was sitting in class, uh, my undergrad, and the professor said something I, I didn't think, I had, it didn't hit me. Sometimes someone will say something that doesn't really hit you until much later. And he had said something that was so powerful, and I think about it often now. Uh, Nancy, he said, uh, truth is the new hate speech. He said, if you tell the truth, you won't be a hero. Uh, and, and when we look at all of the lingering, the tugs in our souls, you can become discouraged by the noise. So one of the things that we have to understand 
that God wants Jeremiah to recognize is that you have to resist the urge to linger at the pool of pity. You have to resist the urge to linger at the pool of pity. If you're feeling this tug and what in the world is going on, all kinds of stuff we're seeing and hearing about, then this message is for you. The condition of our society is so deteriorated that we have become a nation that instead of punishing crime, we elevate criminals to become national heroes. And we play, pay their names in the airwaves and in print. Uh, and Jesus has this strange way in the Beatitudes of sharing that the way up is down. So it's not how many people you can uh, build off the backs of, but he's saying that those that are great must serve everyone else. We understand and recognize that even in our present moment, in our present society, it breaks my heart as I look on Twitter every day, and look at headlines and hashtags, and we don't have to worry about the world attacking us because the church attacks the church. Yes. Even in our church movements, Christians have become more interested with the latest immoral scandals than they have in the moving of the Spirit of God. We don't talk about whose church has revival breaking out. Somebody called me this weekend and was calling me about, asking me, did I hear about some pastor in Florida? Something, I'm in Brooklyn. He asked me about, did I hear about some pastor in Florida running outside the house or something carrying on? And, and, and I, I tell him, I said, no, I didn't hear about it. Now I'll call you back later. I, I don't need all that in my spirit. Yes, yes. You got to guard your ears. I don't need all that stuff. I don't need to worry about what somebody else. I'm trying to work out my own soul salvation. I don't need to hear about somebody else doing. Yes. Okay? And, and so understand that gossip columns run much longer than the Good Samaritan column. There's just as much as good news as bad news, but the bad news sounds. Are you hearing me today? Yes. Telephone wires buzz, not with prayer requests, but with hot, juicy information that has to be passed on with old minds, and I just can't hardly believe it. And did you know? If, on the other hand, we look around for what it means to be mature, whole, blessed, we don't find much. I read an article last year when I was in Haiti, visiting Haiti in May, that had remarked on the present election cycle and it said, Mother William, something to the effect of, it seems as if normal has gone out of the window. And so when we look at this, Jeremiah gets discouraged. And he says in verse number 1 of chapter 12, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Ultimately, we understand and we know the wicked will perish. But he's wrestling with the tension of why it seems as if those who are serving him are always in cycles of defeat. He wrestles with the tension of what's going on. Uh, and when I look at even some of the things that have been brewing with where we are, what concerns me and challenges me is that some of the people that we're putting into power have no idea what it's like uh, for the people they're called to serve. And it's easy to make a policy when what you're making doesn't affect you. It's easy to put something into play uh, when you don't really care whether it happens or not because you're still good regardless. But if we are called to be a prophetic community, we have a responsibility to look out for the widow, to look out for the orphan, to look out for those who are undocumented, those who are documented, those who are in borders, those who are out of borders. Because as the call, the responsibility of the church is really we are called to build bridges and not walls. And so uh, it baffles me because as much as we see all of the stuff that's going on, uh, we look around trying to find people who are serving and people who are 
doing the things that God is calling them to do. Uh, but they don't always make the headline. They aren't always easy to pick out. No journalist is standing to interview them. No talk show is featuring them. They're not always admired. They are not always looked up to. They don't set the trends. There is no cash value in them. We don't find Oscars given for integrity. <laughs> they never make the list of the top most 100 influential people in America. Nevertheless, hear me clearly, the true blood-bought child of God, forgiven of their sins, their name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, was never called to run with turkeys. But we have been challenged and called to fly with eagles. And while Jeremiah is dealing with these challenges, dealing with these issues, dealing with these circumstances, and lamenting about the present situation, God has to remind him to get his head back in the game. I want you to look at somebody and tell him, get your head back in the game. We see all of this stuff and we're seeing all kinds of things and all, all of that that's happening. But wouldn't it be terrible if today there a Super Bowl, uh, all of a sudden uh, you can be so focused on what's happening out there that you forget what's happening in the field. God has to remind you, don't, don't worry about all the stuff that you see. Uh, because even what you see, you must recognize that if you cannot run with the footmen, if you can't run with those around you, what are you going to do when real crisis comes? When we get to a point where we are thoroughly disgusted with the way things around us are going, then we find there is a God-instilled hunger put within each of us that craves wholeness and freshness. It is a hunger for righteousness. Matthew 5 and 6, Jesus says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, we, we, we get fulfillment. We get fulfillment uh, in just uh, looking at headlines. And this week, uh, I'm walking outside and moving it, and all of a sudden people send me pictures of, of, of Beyonce uh, with, 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 with the pregnant picture and all of that. Did you hear about this? Did you know about this? Oh, congratulations. God bless you. I pray if you're watching, call me. Hallelujah. I need some support. Praise God. But either way, uh, I don't live my life off of that stuff. I live my life off of that stuff. And, and, and see, if we look to Scripture, we can find that even in moments of challenge and even in moments of testing, God will always provide for his people. And, and, and what I want us to understand and recognize, we can, we can look at people like Joseph, who if he, he could have let down his moral standard of conduct and melted to the seducing, the seducing wiles of Potiphar's wife, but rather he ran from temptation. That's what we need to hear today, uh, because everybody's engaging with it, but we ought to be able to hear a counter message to what we hear. Okay, uh, we understand. We can look at men like Daniel, who was about to become dinner for a pack of hungry lions, but because he refused to give up his prayer life, God spared him. We can look at women like the mother of Moses, who could easily have succumbed to the fear of Pharaoh and giving up her baby boy to be killed along with thousands of others, but rather by faith hit him in an ark at the river bank, knowing that God would protect. We can look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, who could have doubted what was taking place as she began to carry the Savior of this world, but rather by faith lived her life according to the angel's words and brought forth that precious baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. All of these that I've mentioned and many more could have lived normal dull, mundane, second-class lives, but they didn't. Why? It's found in the text. If you have 
run with footmen and they have wearied you. How can you contend with horses? Our text this morning comes from this time in Jeremiah's life when worn down by opposition and absorbed in self-pity, he was about to surrender to a premature death. He was ready to abandon his calling and settle for being average. At that critical moment, he heard the voice of God speak to him. If you're complaining just about this, what will you do when the real test comes? God was saying to Jeremiah, life might be difficult. But are you going to quit at the first wave of opposition? Are you going to retreat when you find that there is more to life than finding three meals a day and a dry place to sleep at night? Are you going to live cautiously or courageously? Will you stay within the prism of convenience or will you boldly say what I've called you to say? And I believe that we are in a moment and a season and we've been declaring this is a year of expansion and territory taking and all of that. But if you don't have the capacity to maintain that which God wants to give you. What could have been a blessing to expand will then begin to explode. As I was praying this week, the Lord began to remind me, uh, and as I began to pray even for this house corporately, there's a lot of things he's going to begin to even bless us to take on. But God will never bless you with what you cannot manage. So it is easier to be a freeloader. It's easier to be a leech. It's easier to relax in the embracing arms of the average. It is easier, but not better. Easier, but not more significant. Easier, but not more fulfilling. What God is trying to get him to understand and wants us to understand even this morning. I called you to a life of purpose. Far beyond what you think yourself capable of living. And too many times we settle because what we see doesn't add up to what we believe is even possible. So we'll birth an Ishmael instead of waiting for an Isaac. We'll take the first road or the easy step. We'll take the first thing, the first option that we see instead of waiting and trusting in God for what we know he promised us. And at the first sign of difficulty, we're ready to pull the plug. What is it you really want, Jeremiah? Do you want to shuffle along with this crowd? Or do you want to run with horses? So how do we, how do we, how do we begin to adjust ourselves? How do we adjust our lens? to recognize and to understand that which God is calling us to do. Whenever I get a prophetic word, we, we, we have prophets coming here, and we're a prophetic church, and we speak prophetically and all of that. Whenever I get a prophetic word, one of the first questions that comes to me is not, oh my God, I receive it. Oh, no. I, I do receive it. Sometimes I judge the prophets. The prophets are supposed to be judged. I'll just take everything somebody tells me. Matter of fact, most times I'm recording it and then I'm sending it to seasoned people for them to discern it. I don't just take everything for face value. Uh, that's why I'm very careful who I bring. And I reevaluate them after I bring them. That's why sometimes you don't see them come back. Okay. Uh, but but whenever I receive a word, Christine, whenever I receive a word, first thing I do is sit down. After, I, after it's received, I sit down, I process it, I pray over it. I ask myself a question. Who must I become to manifest what I just heard? Who must I become to manifest what I just heard? 
because I got news flash for you. Growth equals change. Let me give you a little equation. Growth equals change. Change equals loss. And loss equals pain. Growth means change. Change means you got to lose something. And if you lose something, it's going to be painful. We don't sign up for more pain, Nancy. Nancy's my own girl. That's why I call her. We don't sign up for more pain. We don't say, oh, more. You know, you're going to see that. Oh, oh, yes, I receive. I want more burden. No, we don't say that. <laughs> but there can never be a blessing without a burden. Amen. And if we're really going to run with footmen, then that means that we have to expand our capacity. Uh, and expanding our capacity, number one, I said we must resist the urge to linger at the pool of pity. Number two, we must remind ourselves often of the marathon principle. And we, that we're in a marathon, we're not in a sprint, which means it takes endurance. They that wait, that's a favorite scripture, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Next thing we have to do is realize that God is preparing you for your future. I ask this morning, I, I'm really asking questions because I want you to wrestle with this. All right. What if the struggle, Chelsea, of today is really strength for tomorrow? <coughs> what if the struggle of today is really strength for tomorrow? What if what I'm presently facing, what I'm presently dealing with, what I'm presently battling is nothing but preparation for what is getting ready to come? When we were in the rental hall two years ago, we were in the rental hall two years ago, and, and we have a church in the rental hall, and I was praying, 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 God, I want to get out of this bed, I can't stand it, I want to get out of here, I want to get out of here, and praying, 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 had no idea that once we were then blessed with something else, the requirements would change. There were things that I had no idea we would have to take care of then uh, because now we have an entirely different load of what? Responsibility. So now uh, it is incumbent upon me to then stretch myself to understand and recognize what is required for where we are. Are you still doing things based off of a season you're no longer in? Are you still married to dreams based off of a time that has passed? That's why I give the vision worksheet. That's why I give it to because I want you to begin to do your homework to assess and to think through and to discern where you are. And then you allow things that no longer serve, things that no longer fulfill, to be released so you can focus on what God wants ahead of you. Is this making sense? Okay? And so I, I want to show you something very quickly over time. I want to show you something very quickly uh, that I believe is important. It's, look, somebody tell me it's all a matter of trust. So there's going to be several things that you have to grow uh, in your capacity uh, if you're really going to, to move from running with footmen to running with horses. I'll give you a couple of these and then I'll close. Okay, I'm not going to give you all of them. Number one, you have to grow your pain capacity. You have to grow your pain capacity. I already told you, growth equals change. Change equals loss. And loss equals pain. You have to grow your pain capacity. God, when I promote you, uh, accept to the tolerance of your pain. The higher you go, the more painful it is. You build resistance. Build resistance. Number two, you must grow your relationship capacity. Your relationship capacity. You have to move from needy people. Get into rooms and environments that challenge you. Okay? That challenge you to grow. That challenge you to move. That challenge you to do. Alright? Uh, because... Uh, you have to be mindful of those who are uh, in your life that are making more withdrawals than deposits. Number three, you have to grow your exposure capacity. Your exposure capacity. Your exposure capacity. Uh, that means that you have to begin to detox your mind. A pastor called me uh, a week or two ago. Uh, when we shared on New Year's Eve about changing your diet. Now, I'm not just talking about physical, uh, but also what you're eating in terms of your reading and your learning and your development. 
changing your diet, changing your diet, changing your diet. And he called me and said, you, that challenge you're talking about that, because um, I'm looking to make some adjustments, make some changes. Uh, your exposure capacity. That means uh, that you have to begin to expose yourself into new things, into new territory. Every now and then, I, when, I, when I'm uh, mentoring someone, uh, we'll, we'll talk about stuff that I'm reading, and then I'll reverse and let them see what they're reading and what they're working on and all that. Uh, just so that you're able to understand. And then what I love to do also now, uh, whenever I get a chance to, I like to listen and see what, what little kids four and five years old is watching. The other day I was with Pastor Jr. with my godson and his daughter was watching some TV show with Disney. And she said, why don't you turn it off and let Pastor Jr. watch something else? I said, no, 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 I'm learning. Keep it on. Why? Because Jesus said, except you come to the kingdom as a child. You cannot enter in. And so I'm, I'm watching him and looking and observing. Went to the bookstore the other day. I was in the kids' section. He said, what are you looking at? I was reading Dr. Seuss. He thought I was crazy. Why? Dr. Seuss was brilliant. He knew how to speak that made the world listen. Most people learn how to read by reading Dr. Seuss. You're mighty quiet. Amen. You know somebody that read Dr. Seuss. You probably did too. Hallelujah. Okay. But growing your exposure capacity. As I've said before, where there is no exposure, there can be no expectation. Where there is no exposure, I'm closing, there can be no expectation. I have to be able to get in an environment that is different so that I can stretch and move to what God has called and commissioned me. Most people love Dr. King. We love Dr. King. We celebrate Dr. King. I think Dr. King would be so surprised today. I think if he woke up today, I'm serious, especially I've done t classes with him about him, read stuff about him, met people that knew I met his sister. If Dr. King was alive today, he would be shocked how we worship him. Guaranteed. Because if you really study and you really read, there's a book Josh and I read this week, The Radical King. If you really read the stuff he was saying the last two years before his life, they hated him. Matter of fact, there was some sermons he was getting ready to preach before he was killed. If he had preached those, he probably would not have been referenced as much as he was because he began to speak against the very things that they were doing in society and the world. So what, we, what have we done? We've really made him more passive than he really was. Because if you really study Dr. King, I'm telling you, saints, if you really study Dr. King, especially the last two years before he died, you'd be shocked to say, that sounds a lot like what's going on now. Matter of fact, there was a famous message he preached, remaining, I think it was remaining awake in the time of revolution. He talked about how uh, uh, Rip Van Winkle, he talked about how uh, he fell asleep and when he woke up, he missed the revolution. He said that's where we were in society. That everybody was lulled to sleep while everything was going on. And it's amazing how uh, we, we try to <laughs> push things over, and put things away. But even in those moments, in those periods, he'd be surprised. If he woke up today and so we got all this stuff erected to him and all of that, because <clears throat> he gave his life by doing something that was uncomfortable. Even his own father told him, you got to stop, they might kill you. But he was committed to what he was called to do. Even when it was not popular. We say thank you today for a sacrifice he paid. 39 years old, tragically lost his life. He has been dead longer than he was alive. But he was committed to something bigger than himself. Are you with me? And God called Jeremiah and said to him, I want you to focus on me. Glory to God. I know what's going on. I know who's in the White House. I know what's happening around. I know people are scared and yelling and screaming and all that kind of stuff, but I want you to focus on me. Because if you focus on me, I'll show you what I'm up to. We need to shift the conversation and shift the question uh, uh, from what in the world is he doing to God? What are you up to? There's something you're up to. Because you're too wise to make a mistake. Is there a lesson you're trying to teach us? Are you trying to bring the nation back to you? Because I sure for know one thing, as things continue to get tumultuous, people are going to begin to scream out, Oh God, help me. 
You tell me right now there was not one person on September 11, 2001 that didn't scream out and cry out to God whether they believed in him or not. For some reason, we love to call God in crisis. We get comfortable and complacent when we think it's our turn and as soon as the table switches, whoa, call on God. So, as I close this message, we have a responsibility to rest in the promises of God. The promise of his presence. The promise of his plan and the promise of his power. The promise of his presence, the promise of his plans, and the promise of his power. If you cannot run with